get it? Did you get it? Hi, I just said, hi. My name is Oded Adomileshem. I'm a documentary filmmaker, educator, and a peace activist. And I came today to talk to you about impotency. I'm not talking about impotency in bed, in the sexual context. OK, I saw some people here nervous. OK, it's not about that. It's about communication impotency, the way that our society is slowly being impotent in a way to communicate, <coughs> sorry, in a way to communicate between each other. Now, uh, how can that be, you say? You know, in the last decade, technology has expanded our ability to communicate. Uh, we have uh, so many ways to communicate through technology. Why are you saying that we are becoming impotent in uh, communication? Well, first of all, it is true. Technology can help us communicate, but it could also ruin our uh, natural uh, ability to communicate on a person-to-person -person level. Uh, now, uh, I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I made a documentary called Voices from El Sayed. And it was done in a Bedouin village in the Negev Desert, not uh, far away, uh, in a village called El Sayed. And I spent there about uh, two years, two and a half years, and my experience there and making the movie really changed the way that I feel about communication and perceived communication, and I want to share with you that. So first of all, let's go to something which is very familiar, the coffee shop. Okay, you enter a coffee shop, it could be in New York, it could be in Rome, Barcelona, Tel Aviv, doesn't really matter. What do you see? This, right? Everybody is sitting together in a public place, but everybody is connected to their digital devices. Their laptops, their iPods, their earphones are connected to the laptops, okay? So we come into a public place, we are all together, but we're doing it alone, okay? We're lonely in this togetherness. Okay, this is Aviv. She's my daughter. And when she was four years old, I first took her to El Sayed, for her first visit to El Sayed. It was already when I was uh, doing the movie. And uh, I uh, entered the village and I went to speak with the grown-ups over there and I was sitting in, in the, the house and speaking to the people and talking to the people and Aviv was outside playing with the kids. Okay, these are some of the kids of El Sayed. When we came back to the car, it was, we enjoyed a really nice afternoon and we went back to the car and I was driving and she was sitting at the back and I was going back to Tel Aviv. She told me, she asked me, uh, Dad, uh, these kids, they can't hear, right? They can't talk. And I told her, yes, they are deaf. And I told her about El Sayed. I told her that El Sayed has the largest community of deaf people in the world, okay? In El Sayed, there is the largest percentage of deaf people in the world because it is a genetic deafness. But what amazed me is that she didn't even think about that. She didn't even realize that uh, they were deaf or there was some problem. She communicated without language because she was not prejudiced because she didn't have these preconceptions. So for her, it was really natural communicating with the kids without language. And I think the first lesson that I learned in El Said is language is just a part of communication. It's just a tiny part, actually. Sometimes we put a lot of emphasis, you know, on language. We say, ah, oh, we can't communicate with this person because we don't share the same language. But communication is a much broader thing, and we have a lot of other tools to communicate. Okay. My first day in El Sayed, I kind of am going back, was in the summer of 2005. I was driving in the Negev Desert, and it was a very hot day, and uh, I wanted to drink uh, something cold, so I stopped uh, my car and uh, had some uh, cold soda in one of the groceries. And I was uh, drinking there, and I saw two kids, about five-year-olds, and they were signing. They were deaf, and they were signing. And I didn't know anything about deaf world or sign languages. I didn't know anything about El Sayed. But of course, it really intrigued me. And when they went back to their village on the unpaved road, I kind of followed them. I walked after them, kind of asking with my eyes if it's OK, seeing that it's OK. I didn't have a crew with me or a camera. And what I saw there was an amazing sight. I saw that the deaf kids were playing with the hearing kids, and the hearing men were sitting 
uh, together with a deaf man and we're talking, everybody knew sign language and it was kind of very natural and the women were together signing and you know, it was a very natural feeling and it kind of made me think about the society where I come from. When sometimes uh, the society where I come from mistakenly calls itself the advanced society. Yeah? It's a big question where are we advancing to, but it calls itself the advanced society. But in the society where I come from, there is a wall, there is a barrier between you know, the different sectors and there, there is a wall and barrier between the hearing people and the deaf people. There is hardly any contact, hardly any friendships between hearing and deaf people. And here in El Side, everything is very, very natural and normal. And you know, the deaf people are integrated into the community and it's just one community of hearing and deaf people. And of course, it really opened my eyes and I fell in love with the people and I stayed there the whole day and everybody invited me for more tea and more cigarettes and more coffee and I had a wonderful day over there. And a week later, I came back again. And a week later, I came back again and again, and I spent the first six months in El Sayed just visiting the people, understanding their story, getting acquainted with them, familiar with them, and also learning sign language from the people themselves. El Sayed is uh, unique in two ways. First of all, like I said, it has the largest percentage of deaf people in the world because of uh, genetic deafness uh, in the village. But it's also, it is also unique because it is an unrecognized village. What does it mean? The unrecognized Bedouin village of Israel are villages that were never formally recognized by Israeli government, even though the people are living in the Negev desert for a couple of centuries. You can actually find El Sayed on Google Maps. You see here where the red arrow is, but you can't find it in any Israeli formal map. Okay, so the uh, 80,000 Arab Muslim citizens of Israel live in the unrecognized villages in the Negev Desert, and they don't have the municipal services even though they are citizens. So there are no paved roads, or no electricity, or uh, no uh, postal service, or garbage collection, etc. And this is, of course, a great problem. Uh, going back to these six months when before I started to shoot the film and learning sign language. So, at the beginning, I just came, okay? Sometimes I was with maybe five or six men in the shig, in this place where the men uh, kind of uh, get together and uh, have uh, coffee, and they were deaf, and I didn't know any sign language. But I did have the will to communicate, and they had a very strong will to communicate with me. So slowly, slowly, I got the first signs, and they taught me sign language, and not only the men, the whole, community, I started to get involved with the community and getting along with many people. This is Sharifa, and this is Jamil, and this is Waida and uh, Suher, and they all taught me sign language. So the first thing I understood is that you have a, to have very strong will in order to communicate. Now we think it is obvious, you know, when you want to communicate with someone, you need, you want it. But it is not obvious because sometimes we are lacking the will and we, are, we can't really communicate with people because we don't really want to engage in true communication. It is true to us and it is true to the other party. So th this is the second thing that I think we can learn from the El Sayed people. You know, there was a strong will to communicate with me. I had a strong will to communicate with them and it succeeded. The second thing I noticed is that when you sign, you have to look at the person. You can't sign and look at the other way around, right? You have to look at the signs, you have to look at the face, you have to look at the eyes. And this is something lacking in the hearing society, okay? Many times we try to communicate, but we don't have eye contact or physical contact or any contact. And we wonder why we can't communicate. Very important thing to know about the sign languages in El Sayed. There are actually two sign languages. The first one is the El Sayed sign language, which evolved through the generations because there were so many deaf people around. Just uh, the language evolved out of necessity, okay? In every family there is a boy or a grandmother or an aunt or someone is deaf. So they invented or a language was, has evolved through the generations and everybody speaks it, both hearing people and deaf people. But the deaf people of El Sayed also speak Israeli sign language. 
which is the sign language that all the deaf Israelis use. Uh, whether they come from Hebrew-speaking homes or from Arabic-speaking homes, they use Israeli sign language. So the deaf people of inside are actually bilingual. And it's different syntax, and it's different vocabulary, and they switch around the languages all the time, and they made fun of me all the time, you know, and kind of knew that I didn't understand because it was a side language. Anyway, they taught me Israeli sign language, and this is also, I started this presentation with Israeli sign language. So we'll see a two-minute clip uh, where my dear friend Juma, which is also one of the main characters, at the beginning he speaks uh, El Sayed sign language, and after that he uses Israeli sign language. So this was uh, Juma, uh, who was the talking, who was doing the monologue, and uh, Muslach and little Nabil, they are all deaf. And these are, you know, I had an amazing two and a half years doing this movie, and I'm still in contact with the, the, with the people who go to visit, and I SMS, I text a lot, so, and we use the uh, text to communicate. We do need technology sometimes. After two and a half years, I finished the film, and I was invited, the film was invited to show in, uh, to have its European premiere in Prague, in One World Film Festival, and I went with Juma to the screening and to do a Q&A. So, the house was full, and we stood on the stage, and the many people around, it was very exciting for me, it was very exciting for Juma, being in a, also in a country that he didn't speak neither the spoken language nor the sign language, okay? Because there's a special Czech sign language. And to do the Q&A, we used, actually, you see, we are six people on stage because it was done in five languages. It was done in English and in Hebrew and in Czech, but it was also done in Israeli sign language and in Czech sign language. And the fact that so many languages were going back and forth actually enhanced the experience in the Q&A. It was really, really fun. And when the Q&A ended, we kind of went to the reception, and I went to talk to the people, and Juma went directly to the deaf people, the Czech people that, they were there, that were there. And they started to communicate with him. So even though they didn't know the languages, they had the will to communicate, and again, they could jump over this obstacle with no problem and communicate. And when I you know, it was pretty late, and I said, okay, Juma, we're going back to the hotel. We had a long day. He said, no, 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 no. I'm staying here with my friends. I'm going out. See you tomorrow, okay? So he made really quick friends, okay? And this is something we can all learn from, quick communication and true communication with this special will. Okay, so lessons learned. First lesson is language is just a tiny part of communication. 
Okay? Many times we try to communicate with people who know our language, but we can't communicate, right? For instance, with our spouses, okay? Sometimes we, d we speak the same language, but there's no communication going on at all, okay? So language is just a tiny part of communication. The second thing is that we have to have strong will to communicate. And the third thing is eye contact or some physical contact that really could help us communicate in a better way. Um, just going back to the start and talking about technology and communication. Remember, we said that technology could help us. Sometimes te technology really can make things worse. That what happens when we count too much on technology? I'll give you an example, a funny example. You know, everybody knows Google Translate, right? Okay, very powerful tool, very useful tool. You can translate from one language to the other pretty easily. What happens when we take a sentence in English, translate it, for instance, to Japanese, and then translate it back to English? It's supposed to stay the same, right? So I took a, uh, this sentence. Once you enter a hip cafe, I strongly recommend to disconnect from your laptops and dig the people around you. Okay, what happened when I translated it to Japanese and back to English? <laughs> Doesn't really make any sense, right? It is recommended that people have to dig the hip once cafe. I will strongly disconnect it from your laptop. You're around. What happens when I do it again? I took this sentence and translated it to Japanese and back to English, supposed to say the same, right? <laughs> it is recommended people that dig the hip once cafe. I will be deleted from your laptop of your strong <laughs> but around you. OK. That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't mean that technology can't help us. It doesn't mean that Google Translate is not good. It's actually pretty powerful. But if we only count on technology and not on ourselves as human beings, we might be in trouble. OK, so just two more things. I really advise you, once you enter a hip cafe, disconnect from your laptops <laughs> and dig the people around you. Try to communicate on a person-to-person -person basis. Try to have some conversation going on. The second thing, if you have the chance in your community to learn the local sign language, do it. It will not only help you communicate with deaf people, it could really help you communicate with other people. Thanks a lot. <laughs>